So welcome everyone. My name is Annie Rogers and on behalf of the Attitude team, I'm pleased to welcome you to today's ADHD experts presentation titled Avoiding and Recovering from 2E Burnout, Support for Gifted Students. Leading today's presentation is Dr. Mary Ruth Coleman. Dr. Coleman is the Senior Scientist Emeritus at the UNC Frank Porter Graham Child Development Institute, where she directs projects, Project U Stars Plus. She has co-authored numerous publications, including the 15th edition of Educating Exceptional Children and Implementing RTI with Gifted Students. In 2017, she was among the first group inducted into the 2E Hall of Fame Recognizing burnout is the first step to avoiding it, and today's webinar will help us to do that. Twice exceptional children have considerable strengths, so the impact of coexisting conditions like ADHD could slide by unnoticed by parents and teachers. But our expert today will help us to identify early signs of stress and introduce some practical strategies to use with gifted students. We would like to begin today's webinar by asking a poll question to our live audience. What is your child's most powerful strategy for avoiding or recovering from 2E burnout? Please select your answers and comment in the text box under the video player to tell us more. While you do that, um, for answers to common webinar questions about slides, transcripts, certificates of attendance, click on the FAQ tab of your webinar screen. If you are listening in replay or podcast mode, visit attitudemag.com and search podcast 467 to access the webinar resources. If you support the work we're doing here at Attitude to strengthen the ADHD community, we encourage you to visit attitudemag.com slash subscribe and sign up for Attitude Magazine for yourself or to share with a teacher or a loved one who could benefit from greater ADHD understanding. Just click the magazine tab in, on your uh, screen to learn more. So without any further ado, I'm so pleased to welcome Dr. Mary Ruth Coleman. Thank you so much for joining us today and for leading this discussion. Thank you, Annie. I'm very excited to be here and I'm excited about um, being part of this whole conversation. Twice Exceptional is very dear and near to my heart. Um, when I was growing up, we didn't have learning disabilities, let alone Twice Exceptional. If we had, uh, then I would have been identified as both learning disabled and um, probably twice exceptional as well. So today we're going to uh, be exploring together the impact of being twice exceptional and burnout. We're going to think about how to recognize some of the early signs of burnout and how to hopefully prevent those before burnout before it even happens. And then we're going to work with looking at how to structure time so that we can better avoid or prevent or predict when burnout might take place. And then creating systems of support through routines um, that can help us make sure that our students, our children are successful. So we're going to have these conversations today and then there'll be plenty of time for questions at the end. So when we think about twice exceptional. Who are these twice exceptional kids? Who are students that are twice exceptional? And you know this from your lived experience because you're parents. And so you see it from that perspective. We're just going to give you a little bit of a flavor of the wide range beyond just your own child. Twice exceptional students are individuals with complex patterns and complex compilations of strengths and challenges. These strengths and challenges coexist, and sometimes they create kind of an internal push me, pull you, where kids are sometimes not certain whether they're operating from their strength side or they're operating from their challenge side. And when they come together, the strengths and challenges sometimes um, 
undermine or interfere with each other, with the strengths sometimes uh, propping up the challenge, but the challenge sometimes go. These complex push me pull use of strengths and challenges create an internal dilemma or pressure that can exacerbate stress. And that's one of the things we have to realize. It kind of predisposes twice exceptional kids to be a little more vulnerable to stress just because they're already living with this inner tension. This combination of strengths and challenges also, however, can contribute to external pressures. Our kids get lots of mixed messages. Some adults will look at them and just kind of say when they're operating from their side that looks more like a challenge side, well, you're just not as smart as you think you are, or I thought you were gifted, or if you were gifted, you'd be able to X. And so kids get mixed messages and that creates problems for them as well. And that creates that additional stress and that additional worry. Charlie Brown said in some cartoon, you know, there is no heavier burden than a high potential. And for our kids who are twice exceptional, they know it. I mean, they, they know that they're smart some days. Other days, they think, maybe I'm not. Maybe the reason that I'm struggling is that I, I'm really not. Maybe everybody just thinks I am. But if they really knew, they would, they would know that I, I really can't read. And so if I really can't read, they would know. And maybe because I'm not being as successful as I want, maybe I'm, I'm just lazy. Or maybe I'm just like crazy. Or maybe, maybe they're just all wrong. So these self-doubts and these worries and these concerns really do, in many cases, undermine our students. Now, the students that we're talking about today are students who have attention deficits, and that's one area that is often combined with strengths or gifts and talents. But it's not just that simple, because oftentimes there are additional complications that our kids are struggling with. So they may have some attention deficit challenges, but they may also have some learning disabilities that coexist with this, or they may have some um, autism spectrum disorder kinds of things like Asperger's that they're dealing with. They may have OCDC and be kind of um, really um, obsessive or compulsive. They may also have difficulty with communication or they may have social anxiety issues. So in addition to the attention deficit, we're looking at a whole range of other possible complications that our kids have. But what we need to remember is they have the strengths and they have the abilities. And with the support, they can be successful. So it's, um, it, it's a wonderful thing to see twice exceptional students. And, and by the way, that combination of twice exceptional, if we can give them the insight into who they are and, and what their strengths and challenges are, oftentimes leads to greater compassion for others who struggle oftentimes leads to a sense of persistence in the face of difficulty, if we can help them develop that, and oftentimes leads to more creative problem solving because they're kind of used to having to solve problems. So if we can capitalize on that compassion, that persistence, and that problem solving as strengths, then we can help them cope with even the most difficult kinds of situations. So the traits that help them through their gifted side, through their strength side, well, meaningful manipulations of symbol systems, thinking logically, given the appropriate data, being able to work through that, storing information to solve problems, retrieving that information can occasionally be difficult, but storing it, they got it most of the time if it gets into long-term memory, if they can get it there. Reasoning by analogy is often a strength and extrapolating to new situations. When they're generalizing information, they can often make kind of leaps and bounds. Sometimes they're not like linear, like A to B to C, but they'll be like A to F to G to D, and they're kind of, but that nonlinear way of thinking 
often makes connections that are very helpful in creative problem solving. So we see this combination of strengths and combination. Part of the strength is that they'll often, in their areas of, of strength, learn more easily. So they may not need the exposures that other kids need to master some information. They may pick something up in uh, one to three repetitions or exposures rather than uh, five to 10 that may be more typical of a learning pattern. And that also can create difficulties because when they're operating in their area of strength, they can be very facile with information. When they're operating from their challenges, it can take long, longer. And that creates more tension as well, depending on what they're doing and where they're operating. So we're talking about extremes. And these extremes and strengths and challenges give kids an asynchronistic pattern across lots of different domains. This asynchronistic pattern can take multiple kinds of forms and each individual is unique and each pattern is unique. I'm gonna be talking in some general terms today in the webinar, but please know that while I may be giving some general ideas and some general comments, I understand fully that each individual is unique and has their own set of strengths and challenges that form their own individual pattern. If we think about this, this line that kind of represents um, the variability in strengths and challenges for any individual, if we think about um, it having perhaps a straight line that may go right through um, from the lowest point, at lowest peak at the end, and that might be typical, what we would call typical development or typical um, accomplishment or achievement. We can see that very little of the developmental pattern for an individual who's twice exceptional is typical. So it, this peaks and valleys are not the issue. Everybody needs peaks and valleys. They make us who we are, they make us interesting, we have them. If you use the analogy of an EKG, you don't want a flat line. <laughs> a flat line would, would be boring. It's the kiss of death, a flat line. So you want peaks and valleys. That's what makes us who we are. But for twice exceptional, these peaks and valleys are extreme. And those extremities can cause a wobble, if you will, because there's so much distance between what they're really good at and what they understand and what just falls through the cracks and they just aren't getting or they just can't manage or they just can't do. So we don't want a flat line. We want some variability in that measure or EKG, but we also don't want a heart attack. And the extremes that twice exceptional kids have can often feel to them like they're in kind of this panic mode with this heart attack going on at some points in time. So how do these peaks and valleys manifest? Well, they kind of can be seen in different ways. They might be seen across time periods. So you might have kids who are much better in the morning when they have um, well rested or their, their day is just kind of starting. But uh, others might be better in the evening or better at a different time period, better after lunch. Never good when they're hungry, never good when they're tired, never good. Um, when they're um, stressed, but across time periods, peaks and valleys, across tasks. Some kids are really great when it's a hands-on problem-solving task, but give them paper and pencil. And one of my students said to me one time, I'm great if you just don't make me do it this way. <laughs> that just doesn't work for me. So sometimes it's subject areas. Some students or some kids are better at math. They struggle with reading. Others struggle with reading. Some struggle when it's a um, subject that requires detailed memorization, just slays them. Others are really good when it's an abstract kind of a concept they're working with and they're bumping it out to a bigger picture. Sometimes the peaks and valleys manifest across settings and when they manifest across settings, 
it's generally the more demanding setting that causes students to kind of crash or kids to kind of begin that burnout pattern. And the more demands are put on a student or a child, external or coping system has to activate and be in order to handle it. So when there are many demands being placed on a child or on a student, those demands can outstrip the individual's capacity to handle the demands, to cope, to adjust. And what happens when the demands outstrip capacity? Well, you've seen it. I've seen it. I've experienced it. You may have experienced it. Withdrawal, drawing back from the environment, acting out, lashing out at the environment, becoming more rigid and not being able to think with flexibility or act with flexibility, but just kind of moving into a safe zone where you know, okay, this is how it has to be done. This is all we can do. Becoming more impulsive, kind of jumping to something, just anything that would keep it out. Becoming irritable, becoming uh, frustrated, becoming angry, shutting down. These responses to the environment outstripping or overtaxing the system are as a result of the pain, the fear, the worry, the um, sense of feeling overwhelmed, the sense of feeling helpless that individuals experience when they begin the process of burnout. What we need to help ourselves and our kids do is look for the patterns. Look for the patterns that are the precursors or the antecedents to becoming overwhelmed in any given situation. These patterns that show time, task, subject, setting will show us where greater support may be needed. It will show us where we might anticipate that the, a problem will emerge. And if we can anticipate, we can plan ahead. We can prepare. We can get ready so that we can kind of de-escalate ahead of time whatever the response is going to be. And then if we recognize the patterns and we recognize the strengths and the challenges as well, then we can identify strategies that work. The opening question that Annie asked you to think about, which was, what is your child's best response or coping strategy to help them with um, dealing with being overwhelmed or help them get out of being uh, feeling that way or get back into a, a de-escalated uh, place where they can operate more naturally and normally? My dissertation when I was doing my doctoral work was on coping strategies and on working with, um, I interviewed uh, students who had learning disabilities, who had not been identified as being gifted as well. And then I interviewed um, a comparison group of similar age. They were all boys at this point, um, uh, same age and same kind of strat issues, but they, in addition to being identified as a learning disability, had, um, had been identified or recognized as having gifts or having uh, measures that indicated high strengths. The major difference between the two was that my twice exceptional population, and there were 20 of each, could share with me ideas about how to manage their stress and anxiety and what to do. But they often said when I asked, so how does that work? How does that work for you? Well, I, I know to do it, but I don't actually do it. And we're going to talk a little bit about that, knowing what to do and then kind of moving forward to do it um, and put it into practice. But before we do that, um, I just kind of want to take a peek at burnout and let us think through what it actually is. Because burnout is that kind of state of emotional, physical, or mental exhaustion that is caused by excessive or prolonged, prolonged stress. It's when we, when we reach that point where we're just like, 
That's it. Shutdown starts to happen. It occurs when we feel overwhelmed, drained, or when the demands are constantly out in our capacity. It's different for everyone, but burnout will affect our daily activities and our daily life. So recognizing it early is much better than going full tilt into it till we're shut down. So I want to give you these, these P words that help us with, with what we're working on. Pattern recognition. We want to recognize what those patterns are that are the antecedents and possible uh, situations or contexts where we may begin to feel overwhelmed. Pattern recognition helps us understand ourself, our strengths, and our own uh, challenges. And that's the place to start. The next P is predictability. Once we recognize patterns and we can see those patterns, we can begin to predict what might happen. So what might happen if I get into this particular situation or this particular thing happens? I can predict it. If I can predict it, I can prepare. I can know ahead of time, well, if this might happen, here's how I might respond in that situation. And I can think about it. What might work? What might I do? Would this be a you know, place where I might pull out this strategy or that strategy? If I can prepare, I can practice. And I can practice in situations that are safe where I'm not already in a panic or overwhelmed or beginning that burnout process. And then the others are kind of how this moves forward. We have to be really patient because just because we can recognize the pattern, we can prepare for it and we've practiced responding to it doesn't mean it's going to work for us. And if it doesn't work for us, it doesn't mean that it's not the right strategy could not be the right strategy, but it, what it may mean is we just need to practice it a little more. We need to be patient with ourselves and with others as we get the hang of this. But if we're patient and if we keep and persistent is another P, if we're persistent, then we'll make progress in coping and we'll make progress in um, preventing. And if we can do that, then we lead to prosperity. Uh, we lead to success. We lead to um, prosperity. And prosperity means to thrive, not just succeed. We become prosperous in who we are and what we do. So pattern recognition, predictability, preparedness, practice, persistence, patience, progress, and prosperity. I think I like alliteration a little too much. With kids... Burnout is a little different than with adults, and kids sometimes feel much more trapped, and they feel much more helpless. So they really do need additional support. The four dimensions that we can work with to help our students become better at coping with difficult situations so they don't become overwhelmed we're going to look at time, we're going to look at structure, we're going to look at support, and we're going to look at motivation. Time is one of those things that's kind of abstract, and we need to kind of unpack it so it becomes more concrete, so it becomes more um, uh, tangible for our students and for ourselves as well. Sometimes visual schedules, which I'm sure most of you are aware of, is a really good thing to do. So putting in a visual, visual schedule that has pictures or words or, you know, this first, this, then, then this, and then that. And when we do things is very helpful. And we sometimes think about those visual schedules as for little kids. I teach my college students that have disabilities to do this. I teach them to create a schedule um, looking first at the calendar for the semester and putting on that calendar all the important dates from their syllabuses that they've gotten from their classes and taking a look at what that's going to mean and when, when can they anticipate 
a stressed out time period because they have three major things due in different classes. Right? High school students, it works the same way. Then I teach them to do a weekly schedule. That weekly schedule takes each day is broken up in either half hour or hour quadrants, and it indicates what happens on each day, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. And I ask them to color code first. What must they do? And I ask them to pick their favorite color for that. Their favorite color is blue. Do that one in blue. Okay. But these are non-negotiables. These they have to do. And then to go back through and put in what should they do. Pick another color. And they should do some things. I mean, there's some things. And, and for different kids, different things are, are different variables. For some, um, practicing the piano might be a should do. For others, it's a must do. I must practice. I'm getting ready for a recital. And then add to that schedule, what do you want to do? What's going to be fun for you? What do you want to do? Put it on your schedule because that's really important too. And then you look at that schedule and you can look at that with your child. And you can look at that and say, where are the possible days that are stressful? Where are the possible um, things that are happening during the week that are stressful? If we know it's stressful, do, what can we do about it? Do we, do we need to back off? Do we need to change the day of your piano lesson? Because that day is already overwhelming. What are the things we can do to see the pattern of that schedule? and take some pressure off. And maybe it's just too full and we just need to take some things away. And that's sometimes really hard for really bright kids and gifted kids who want to do it all, want to, don't want to give up anything. Planning for the week at the beginning of the week, looking at that schedule, looking at what's going on with it, review each day's schedule, slim it down if possible. And then think about where you can plan for Minutes of mindfulness to regroup, just minutes of mindfulness. So you can say, well, you know, maybe on the ride from school to the lesson, we can take a minute of mindfulness and we can regroup. And we'll talk about that in a minute again. But we can breathe. We can relax. We can refocus. And when we're doing our schedule, we need to also build in some breaks and build in some times that are going to be down times as well. And then when we have a task that we need to do, the task itself can feel overwhelming unless we task analyze, which means breaking that task into smaller pieces and building in the breaks as we build, um, as we work across the task. And task analyzing is really, really important so that the task, we don't just look at this thing and go, there's no way that I can do that. There's no way I can do that. Well, you can. You can't do it all at once. You take a bite. You take a baby step. You move forward. That's task analyzing. So what are mindful minutes? Mindful minutes are um, things like, this is for maybe older kids, but any, any time, the stop method. Stop. Take a deep breath. Observe your feelings and your environment. Pay attention and then proceed with thoughtfulness. Stop, take a breath, observe your feelings and the environment, what's happening. Take a breath and then proceed with thoughtfulness rather than impulsivity. Starfish breathing is for really little kids, but it can also be helpful for older ones. Make a starfish with your hand and help the kids learn to take a deep breath and exhale. Do it with me. As they trace that starfish. And then trace it back. 10 deep breaths, starfish breathing, help calm, help center. Creating a glitter jar where it's, or a snow globe where you can help kids visualize and see when they're upset by shaking it. 
that's what's happening in your mind. Everything is just feeling overwhelmed and I can't think and I'm getting stressed and I don't, can't do anything about it. Shake the jar and then watch it as it settles down. And as it settles down in Educating Exceptional Children, um, which is the textbook, the 15th edition that I'm uh, an author on, we have in every chapter examples of uh, mindful minutes and mindful um, mindfulness calming exercises for kids. So creating systems of support. Creating these systems of support is really important early on before the burnout happens, before the stress happens. And doing that, we can establish routines that preset the day the night before. We can develop daily patterns that help respond to the rhythms of your child, kind of the natural rhythms. When are they in their stride? When are they going to be hungry? When do they need a snack? <laughs> when do they need, you know, uh, downtime, you know? And so we can create those daily patterns, and then those can be built into the schedules. We can create calming and fun rituals that mark transitions. Oftentimes, those transition uh, points in the day become hectic and stressful, but they don't have to be. They can be mindful minutes. They can be um, marked by um, thoughtfulness. Okay. Then we can also be very explicit about expectations. We can describe what the task is, what the situation is, what it's going to look like, what it's going to entail. We can practice before we get there. You probably all have experience on, on talking about maybe a birthday party or a graduation event or a, a family gathering. What is it going to be like? How are we going to, um, what are the demands going to be? What is it going to look like? What are our safety valves? What are our escape hatches? What are we going to do if we start to feel overwhelmed? Um, and then we practice that in, in the situation and we generalize it to new situations. And we plan for that. As the adult with the boots on the ground, we have to remember to be flexible. We have to remember to breathe. We have to remember to take mindful minutes. We have to remember to operationalize these things as well. And then we structure for support. We organize the environment so that the environment is supportive. And this structure includes planning an environment that helps us be uh, supportive, planning an environment for study and keeping that environment kind of, if not sacrosanct, then at least protected for studying where it has everything they need and the distractions are minimized. Planning areas for play, planning areas for eating planning these environmental areas, putting things in the same place so that we're not frantically looking for things that we've lost, putting the sports equipment where it goes so we aren't always uh, wait, you know, pa panicked and trying to find what we need, making sure that the backpack on Sunday has been sorted, cleaned, and repacked for the week to come might have to happen every every night. But asking students, what should your backpack look like if it was going to help you be successful in school? It shouldn't look chaotic. It shouldn't have five uh, weeks worth of homework that you never turned in because you couldn't find it when you needed it. And you, so you didn't get it turned in. So you didn't get credit, but you had done it even though you couldn't find it. So sort it. Ask your, ask your child, ask your student, you know, what should a backpack look like? Create a checklist. All right, together we're going to make sure on Sunday night that your backpack looks like this. We're gonna check off everything you said it should be. No extra clutter, everything I need, my notebooks, pens, whatever, okay? So doing that preset is really important. And then gradually turning that checking over to the, to the student or the individual. Is your backpack ready for tomorrow? Yeah, it's ready, yeah, it's ready. All right, I'm gonna check it. If it is ready and I can check off everything, you can pick a dinner this week or you can do X, Y, or Z. Decluttering the space, removing things that are distractions. This is a hard one. It's a hard one for me. You can see behind me, I've got lots of stuff. But anyway, removing things that are distractions 
using clear bins if you put things away so that you can see them, you can see into them if you need them. And then in addition to decluttering, add beauty, make it beautiful with visuals or sounds or smells. And then the, the other way for support is so, and that social, uh, using social relationships is really critical. Talking with your kids about their feelings, exploring with them what they think could be done. Best question in the world for a student, for a kid, for your child. If you had a friend that was experiencing this, what advice would you give them? When I asked that question in the dissertation, it was unbelievable what the students came up with. When I asked them if they had done any of those things, they often said no. And I said, you ought to think about doing this. You know what to do. Help your child build friendships and encourage them to engage. I mean, building friendships can be really, really difficult. Um, but if they uh, watch people that they admire and people that they feel are worthy of friendship, and ask them what that means to them. What does it mean to be worthy of friendship? And what does it mean for you to be worthy of being a friend? And then ask them to kind of watch and see. And I tell them they can be a spy and they can see what these people do that they think are worthy of friendship. And, and then they can practice in safe situations doing what, they, what they've seen. And then they can develop, um, I guess, what, they, what we might call their little, um, I don't know, their, their little act if it, at the beginning of how would you act if you wanted to be someone's friend or you were trying to build that friendship. One of the best ways to build friendships is to get kids together doing things together that they love. So form social groups around the interest that your child has. Um, ask, the, ask the school to form a club around robots if that's what your kid loves. Ask them to form a club or form a club yourself around something like that. So motivating um, for support. Um, everybody has something that motivates them. For twice exceptional kids, it's, it's not often the same kinds of things. I mean, they may or may not be motivated by getting an A. They might not care. And in some cases, they might think that's stupid. But there's something that's motivational to them. So find out what it is. Find out what that reward is that they would like to have. And then kind of assign that reward a, a number of, of points. Make it tangible. Make it like, you know, um, this reward is it may be a, a concrete thing. Maybe they want a new bicycle. I don't know. But then say, well, you know, that's a, that's a big ask. That's a big thing. So maybe that's, you know, 500 points. I don't know. But then find a way to give those points out. So a chart, a matrix, I'm big on matrices. Help your child establish a goal and then help them accomplish this. I want to work 15 minutes on a project. I want my room clean. I want my backpack organized. I want whatever it is. And you can also help with identifying goals, but it has to be the child's goal ultimately. When they meet their goal, either daily or weekly or whatever that is, they get a star under that goal for that day, for that week, for that time period. And that star is worth how many points? Assign a number of points, maybe five, maybe one, maybe 15, if it's a big ask. The stars stay there, they don't go away. If they don't meet that goal that day or that week, they just don't get a star. They don't get punished, they don't, don't get a star, which means they aren't earning points to their goal, to, to their reward, whatever reward they picked. If they don't meet that goal two times in a row, a conversation. Is that goal still worthy to you? Is it still important to you? What do you think is going wrong? Why aren't you making progress toward it? What, what are we doing here? What's happening? If they um, don't meet it three times, then, the, then it really is a discussion. It doesn't seem like that goal is important to you and or the, what's motivating you is not important to you. We need to regroup. The system isn't working because you've missed your goal three days or three weeks or whatever it is, three times in a row. And so you track that with the star chart. Now, this may sound like it's for little kids. My first um, job out 
from uh, doing the dissertation, from finishing my doctorate, was working in a very small junior college, setting up a program to support students in their transition to college, students who had areas of disability and some students who had just been very underachieving in high school and we thought needed additional support to be successful in elementary school before. So I had all my like old teacher supplies and I had a drawer full of desks. Now I'm at a college campus and I have a drawer, desk drawer, and in it there's stars. One of the things that each student was asked to do was pick a college professor and go and explain what their strengths were, but what their needs were and self-advocate. Now we practiced this, we went through this, they knew their spiel, they did it with me, I role played with them, the good professor, the bad professor, the, ignore, the careless professor, we role played everything. And then they picked the professor. One of my students had a really hard time doing this. By the way, I'd also worked with the professor so they knew that to anticipate their students coming in. And he just had a really, really hard time. He'd pass my room, he'd stick his head in. I'd say, uh, have, have you been able to meet with a professor yet? No, no, but I'm going to. No, no, that I'm going to. And finally, when he poked his head in and he came dashing to my office and he said, I did it, I did it, I talked to the professor and this is what happened. And it had gone well and he'd been successful. And I pulled out a star. I pulled out his file folder because it was part of his, his goal to do. And I put a star on the page that said this is what he was going to do. And I put the star there. and He just beamed. By the end of that day, nine or ten college students came in and said, you gave Henry a star. I didn't get a star. Why didn't I get a star? I did it. A star is a celebration. It's a recognition. For the most part, Strategies to relieve distress include those kinds of things that we know help us reground and help us feel more in control of who we are and where we're going. If we plan ahead of time, then we can operationalize those strategies as soon as we recognize that we're sliding out. Mindful minutes help, regrouping help, exercise, deep breathing, visualization, um, social supports, Removing ourselves from the stressful situation, walking away, stopping, using the stop method. Teaching strategies like that before they're needed are, is, is essential. It's, you cannot teach the strategy when the stress is unfolding. The goal of all support systems and routines is that individuals become autonomous, they become independent, and they become successful. And that's the goal. Think about these things. Knowing yourself is key. Knowing what your strengths and challenges are. Knowing how to advocate for yourself. Knowing the strategies that work for you and asking them how they will manage their time, their environment, and their tasks. And knowing that they're not alone, that there are support systems that can help them. And there are supporters who can help them be successful. And always remember that you are braver than you believe, stronger than you seem, and smarter than you think. And by the way, so is your child. Thank you. I think we have time for questions. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. Coleman. We do have a number of very good questions. And I will just start out by giving a recap of the results from our survey, which were quite interesting and dovetailed nicely with your um, suggestions and recommendations. We asked um, what your child's most powerful strategy for avoiding or recovering from 2E burnout. And um, the most common answer was carving out time for non-academic pursuits and passions, which you discussed and um, literally <laughs> sitting down with the calendar and setting aside these times. And so more than a third of you said that that is the most effective um, strategy. And, and similarly, right on its tail was following a structured routine. Um, those go hand in hand. So that makes, um, that makes perfect sense. 
And then um, the third was chunking up big tasks into smaller bits. Um, Perfect. Right. So, um, so that's wonderful to, to hear that so many um, people are putting these strategies and that their kids are finding them really effective in real life. So that is wonderful. Um, and I wanted to start out with a question um, that came in regarding, well, there were quite a few that I'm going to ask about um, advocacy. Um, and one parent in particular said that her two son um, had a major burnout and that the school's uh, solution for this was a two-day extension on assignments, which did not help. And so she's asking um, for ideas on how to work in burnout accommodations into a 504 plan. She, that is spot on that um, this has to be up front. And again, it's, it's that preparation that we do up front. Um, first of all, I'm very sorry that happened for your son. And it's not uncommon um, that there's not an understanding of how to provide these accommodations and what to do after the fact um, in response to. Um, I remember going to a meeting for one of my twice exceptional students, brilliant young man, who just had a, a, a tremendous difficulty with written assignments, um, even using computers or whatever, which is very, very difficult. And he was so stressed and so burned out. And I remember saying to the team of teachers sitting around, are you literally trying to kill this child? Are you literally trying to make sure this child cannot be successful? in your classroom. And this was a set of high school teachers. And they said, no. And I said, well, that's what it feels like. That's what it feels like to me. And that's what it feels like to him. And I said, now we're going to work this out as, a, as adults. And then we're going to bring him in to help us um, fine tune this. I could not bring him into that meeting initially because I didn't feel he was safe in that environment because I didn't think the teachers understood what was going on. Ideally, our kids help to self-advocate, but we have to protect them and make sure that, that it's a safe environment that we're bringing them into. So what should be in a 504 plan? In the 504 plan, we need to have preset for um, support, for task analysis. So if there's a big project, we need to have preset support for breaking that down and turning it in in pieces so that um, if it's a big research project, the topic and the description of what the plan is, the questions go in first. And then two or three days later, we've mapped it out on the calendar. Um, the resources that are going to be used, a list of five, six, seven, eight, whatever resources that are going to be used, websites if necessary, um, are brought in and approved. Each of, the, each of the steps is laid out, and we put in that 504 plan support through task analysis for accomplishing large tasks. And we give an example like that if we need to, or we are ready to give an example like that if we need to. And then a draft of the paper, and then feedback, and then a draft. And then we also look at that time, and we indicate extended time is allowable both for taking assessments, for sure, if need be, if need be, and if the student requests that, and for additional projects. Fixation, and, and oftentimes, especially in our advanced classes, exceptional kids get um, this whole thing about, well, I'm in an advanced class, and I have to um, have all my kids have the same thing, no accommodations because they're supposed to be gifted anyway. So we have to build into that, um, working with the teacher on what is a reasonable timeline for accomplishing various tasks and how does that work and how does that move forward? And with that, we need to um, make sure that the teacher knows that two days is extra days may not be enough and tr 
it, it's hard for teachers to understand that what we want is completion and success. And it's not about the amount of time. And if they, I've had teachers say, well, if I give him extra time, I'm going to have to give the whole class extra time. And my response is, hmm, something to think about. What do you want? Do you want excellence or do you want fast? I mean, what do you want? Do you want success or do you want deadline? And sometimes teachers will say, no, I actually, I want the deadline. And occasionally you can say, well, if that's where you're going to hold the line, then that's your prerogative. But putting it in the IEP, task analysis, extended time, and warnings, um, checkpoints along the way, so that the, there's a red flag if we're not meeting that deadline and what we can do about it. Those are wonderful suggestions. Um, and it points to another question, which was quite common um, among our listeners here today. And that is, you, you kind of touched on it, but a number of people writing in to say that um, they are encountering, encountering educators and other professionals who are resistant to the idea of 2E, just aren't familiar with 2E, and they want to, especially here at the start of a new school year, at least here in the U.S., um, they want to start off on a good, fit, good foot, wondering if you have recommendations for explaining um, and advocating forcefully without setting up, uh, you know, <laughs> uh, two warring sides. Yeah. 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 It, we don't want to set up adversarial relationships with a team that is there to, to help our, our child. I mean, we, we want to have relationships that, that are, um, partners with our school people, but, the unfortunate thing is that there are many educators that are, are not aware of um, twice exceptional students and needs. And that's in spite of the fact that there's a lot of material and a lot of professional development that, that has uh, been done to help students with twice, uh, help teachers understand twice exceptional students. So uh, the answer is yes, there are resources out there. There are some kind of short kind of readings that can be offered and I think that what we could do, Annie, my understanding is that there's going to be some resources put together as well as part of the um, attitude follow-up to this survey, to this survey, to this um, webinar. Yes. And so what we might want to do is focus those resources on that advocacy. The One of the first things is to make sure that there is a 504 plan or an IEP in place. And if there is an IEP, then you will want to make sure that the strengths of the child are addressed as well as the areas of concern within that IEP. Um, and so the, um, the difficulty is doing that preparation ahead of time to make sure that those are in place before they're needed. Um, we address the 504 plan and the IEP plan in the textbook at length in various chapters, and that's very helpful. But it also is um, important to put in place a relationship that says to the, um, to the teachers, I am here to support you in helping my, my child be successful. My child has strengths and my child has challenges. If possible, get the child to come in and do themselves. Now, we've also found that for younger kids, writing a letter to the next year's teacher of introduction and saying, and um, I just want you to know I'm really excited about the fourth grade. And the kids put it in their own words. Sometimes they'll say, I'm a little quirky. I'm really, really good at some things and some things are just really hard for me. And they send that letter to the teacher. Um, and the teacher has that letter before they even meet the student sometimes. And that can be really helpful and very effective. And then in the closing, the, the child can say, I'm really excited to meet you. And um, I'd like to meet you. you know, and I'm looking forward to your class. And, and then that prompts the self-advocacy that's necessary and that becomes part of it. And then bringing kids early into their IEP meetings. When teachers hear from kids what they need, 
they're oftentimes more responsive than they think, oh, well, mom just is trying to overprotect or, you know, dad just won't let him grow up or whatever. When kids can articulate what they need, teachers often are more responsive. And I guess that would be my advice on advocacy, support as much as possible self-advocacy. Okay. Um, and I will mention, we will include these links in the after webinar resources. We do have a few templates for letters, just like the one you mentioned. Um, so students can get some ideas about what they might want to include. So we'll, we'll add those to the resources. Um, on the sort of the flip side of this, but it, also a number of listeners here today who said that for one reason or another, whether it's teasing or stigma and shame, um, their students are resistant to accepting the accommodations. That in some cases, they have the 504 set up, and one parent said he says he doesn't want them because he's afraid that if he, for example, takes breaks, as is in his 504, that he'll miss class time and he'll fall behind. Um, so... Any advice for those parents to um, help their kids to accept the help that they know um, they need, but ugh, it's hard to, to take? Yeah. Oh, Annie, that is such a hard one. I mean, it is just uh, painful when you know that you've created the opportunity for support and kids are like, nah, not, nah, not doing it. And you, you articulated very nicely some of the reasons that they say, I don't want to be different. I don't want people to make fun of me. I don't want to lose ground. I don't want to lose face. I don't want to admit that I need help. Um, what we really, really need to do is create a culture in classrooms where individual strengths and needs are just part of the mix where everybody gets what they need and everybody gets what they um, uh, deserve and, or, or require in terms of challenges and that it, it's perfectly normal. And um, it's not a stigma and it's not a, um, a, a something that I do for one child and not for another child. The uh, one teacher that I had worked with that was brilliant at this, at the beginning of the year, she did this exercise with her class. And she was a middle school teacher and she told her class to put them in a circle. And she said, OK, we're going to we're going to take a look at studying kind of how uh, doctors work and kind of what happens and, and what happens in, in our health unit. We're, you know, she kind of made this up the whole thing about what they were doing. And she said, I'm going to give each of you a card. And on the index card, I have written um, a set of symptoms. And these are symptoms that you have. And your task is in this week to research those symptoms. And on the back of the card, it said, what is my diagnosis, okay? And what is my prognosis? Your diagnosis is what do you have? Your prognosis is what do you do about it? And what is gonna be, what are you gonna get? Because you have this. And when they came back on Friday, she said, she waited purposefully for a while. And she said, oh my gosh, I forgot. We need to go through your cards make your circle for, for circle time, make your circle quickly. We're going to go through this like popcorn though. You're going to, you're going to read your symptoms and you're going to tell me what you have. I'll be the doctor and I'll tell you what your prognosis is and we'll go through them really quick. So don't stop. Just keep going. Okay. First one, read, read symptom. Uh, my femur bone, my arm bone is jutting out. I have whatever, you know, blood, et cetera, et cetera. And I have a fracture of whatever that bone's called. I have a fracture of this bone in my arm. The teacher says, yes, that's right. Take an aspirin. Come back and see me if you don't feel better later. Like looking at her like, are you crazy? She says, next one, next one. We're in a real hurry. And the next one says, well, I have a really bad headache and I feel sick to my stomach and, da, 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 and, and I, um, I actually have, I have um, COVID. Yes, that's right. Take an aspirin. Come back and see me in a week if you aren't feeling better. Next. The kids are going nuts. By the time the fourth or fifth student has read their symptoms, said what they have, she's acknowledged they've had it. And as the doctor, she's prescribed, take an aspirin and come back and see me if you don't feel better in a week. Finally, the kid, they're muttering. Like, that's ridiculous. No doctor would do that. That's malpractice. That's, you can't do that. That's crazy. And she stops them at that point when they get so restless. And she says, what's the matter? 
And they say, the brave ones. Well, that's ridiculous. No doctor would say, take an aspirin and come back and see me in a week if you have a fractured arm. That's crazy. Gangrene's going to set in. They're going to lose the arm. You're going to lose your practice. It's malpractice. Nobody would do that. And the conversation starts there. She lets it go for a little while. And then she says, all right, stop. Now, here's the deal. In my classroom, each of you has a unique set of symptoms, a unique set of strengths, a unique set of needs. In my classroom, each of you needs different things from me in order to be successful. My job is to be fair. And she says, so one way to be fair is to give everybody the exact same thing. Everybody gets an aspirin and they get to wait for a week. But is that fair? And the kid's like, no, that's not fair. He's going to lose his arm. She's going to die of COVID. She's going to have this. She's going to have that. So it's not fair. She said, that's right. It's not fair. So what is fair? In my classroom, what fair means is I will work equally as hard for each of you to be successful. That's what's fair. I want each of you to be successful. And I will set up whatever circumstances I can for you to be successful. But that means that I need to do different things for you at different times. Now, I'm not a mind reader. You're going to have to help me with this. I can't help you be successful if you don't tell me what you need. I may see you struggling and I may ask you, do you need some extra time with that? I may see you bored and I may ask you if you need to go on to something else, but I may not. There are a lot of you and I'm pretty busy. So you're going to have to tell me what you need. Now, don't tell me every minute, every, every day. <laughs> Sometimes you may be bored and you're going to have to live with it. Sometimes you may be a little frustrated and you're going to have to work with it. But if you're bored or frustrated over time, and I'm not seeing it, you must tell me because I'm here to teach you and teaching means you learn. And if you're not learning, I'm not teaching. And teaching is what I get paid the big bucks for. So you've got to help me do my job. You've got to tell me when you need extra help. You've got to tell me when you're bored. Again, not every minute, not every day. Sometimes you're just going to have to suck it up. <laughs> but don't suck it up all the time. Work with me. Mm -hmm. And by the way, when one person is doing something that another person is not doing, don't come and talk to me about, now you sent Rebecca down to the library two days in a row, and you haven't let me go to the library at all. No, no. I'm going to tell you to take an aspirin and come back in a week. <laughs> you need to go down to the library. You come and tell me that. And you come and tell me why. And then we'll think about why you need to go to the library. So she did this with her students. And she said, that's what fair means in this classroom. It doesn't mean everybody gets the same. It means I try to the best of my ability to give everyone what they need. The problem that she ran into was the parents didn't get it. <laughs> the parents were like, well, I'm telling you what, I heard that so-and-so did such and such such. And she said she desperately wanted to look at them and say, take an aspirin and come back in a week if you don't feel better. <laughs> but what she decided to do was have the students run that same activity with their parents on open house night. Asked the students to explain to their parents what fair meant in their classroom. Brilliant, brilliant. And that's the culture we need to establish in every classroom. Wonderful. Dr. Coleman, that's a, that's a great note to end on. Unfortunately, we are out of time, but um, I know that I learned so much in the last hour and we are so thankful for your contributions to the Attitude community. Thank you for leading this webinar today. And thank you to everyone who joined us and who submitted your questions and who listened along. We hope that you will all join us in the future for more Attitude webinars. You can get updates on those as well as our articles and our research updates.
by signing up for our newsletters at attitudemag.com slash newsletters. For now, um, have a wonderful day. And thank you again, Dr. Coleman. Thank you, Annie.